Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church, Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. It is a great moment when we have Human Rights Watch in the house. We have had a a lengthy, uh, meaningful relationship with Human Rights Watch. I'm on the um, California South Committee, um, Southern California Committee. And uh, my wife and I and uh, a group of us from All Saints go to the annual dinner, which will be held tomorrow night in Beverly Hills. And it's always a moment not only of inspiration but transformation for us because Human Rights Watch for a long time has courageously been in solidarity with those people throughout the world who are marginalized, who live in harm's way, who are abused and threatened and killed, and there's no one to monitor what is going on and report it, save in many instances Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch is a valued partner, not only of um, the State Department, but certainly of the White House. And in a day in which we are talking about our own relationship with the presidency, it's a wonderful moment to have this very fruitful and effective organization present so that you can know the kinds of people, the kinds of things that are going on, and why our president and secretary of state and others want always to have Human Rights Watch and their very objective monitoring and reporting close by. So, as is the case frequently, our um, guests are, um, speak a language other than English, and uh, we have to have um, a translation, which we will have today. And I do want to say that um, in the case of uh, one person in the past, um, our guest was here at All Saints Church, and then two or three late years later, she was the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. We don't know what will happen to our guest uh, today. <laughs> the way it works, as you'll, you'll know, is we have these courageous people, from whom one of whom we will hear from, paired with a staff member of Human Rights Watch. And All Saints is a partner with Human Rights Watch. We give some of the money that you give to All Saints to Human Rights Watch. And our money goes toward paying for and supporting in the field these uh, courageous um, staff people. Ida Sawyer is with us today, someone who knows about the part of Africa we're going to be speaking about and addressing. So will you now warmly welcome Ida Sawyer from Human Rights Watch. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ida Sawyer, Africa researcher and advocate for Human Rights Watch. For the past five years, I've lived in the Democratic Republic of Congo, documenting horrific human rights abuses across the country and trying to keep track of the alphabet soup of armed groups and their constantly shifting alliances, leadership, and support bases. This year, one of our main focuses has been on a new rebellion in eastern Congo called the M23. The rebellion is led by a man wanted by the International Criminal Court for War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity, General Bosco Antigonda. We've been documenting Bosco's crimes for over a decade as he's moved from one armed group to another, committing the same types of abuses wherever he goes. His new rebellion now controls a significant chunk of Eastern Congo's Ruturu territory, right on the border with neighboring Rwanda and Uganda. The M23 rules through terror and fear, with the rebels responsible for widespread war crimes. Our job is to document these abuses, something which isn't easy when the M23 particularly targets human rights activists, journalists, and anyone who dares to speak out against the abuses. Last month, a Congolese human rights activist named Tatiana was planning to investigate allegations of a mass rape of 22 women and girls in Bunagana town. The night before she left her home in Ruchuru, Eight M23 fighters came to her house, forced the door open, shouting out for Tatiana. When they found her, they dragged her out of the house and told her, we are first going to rape you, then kill you. You are accusing us of raping and killing. 
we're going to do the same thing to you so you can witness it as well. They then pulled her into the forest behind her house and started tearing off her clothes. Tatiana was terrified, but thought of a way she could maybe get away. She told them, let me take my pants off to make this easier for you. Then she pulled back a bit, and as they loosened their grip on her, she started running. The M23 fighters shot her in the leg as she fled, but they didn't come after her. Tatiana soon made it to our office in Goma, the main town in eastern Congo, just west of the M23's area of control. We helped her get urgent medical care, but once she left the hospital, she had nowhere to go but to hide in our office because she was scared the M23 infiltrators in Goma would find her. We're now helping her find a safe way to get out of Congo. Because of stories like this, our biggest challenge is often find how to find a way to interview victims and witnesses without putting them in even more danger. I am known by most of the M23 leadership, and when I go to areas under their, their control, I'm closely followed, and people who speak to me will be threatened or worse. So we often need to find ways to bring people outside of M23-controlled areas to talk to us. In addition to documenting the M23's abuses, a big part of our job is trying to figure out who's responsible, who gives the orders, and where they get their support. With the M23, we found that the entire rebellion has been orchestrated and supported by senior Rwandan army and government officials, the same individuals who have backed numerous rebellions in eastern Congo in order to maintain their sphere of influence and control over eastern Congo's vast mineral resources and other riches. We then use our detailed research on Rwanda's support to the rebellion based on hundreds of interviews with defectors, current fighters, civilian witnesses, and others, to show U.S. government officials and others how senior Rwandan authorities could also be complicit in war crimes committed by the M23, and that they also should be held accountable and sanctioned, and that a solution to the crisis with the M23 will only be found when Rwanda stops backing the rebellion. We've made some progress on this, with the United States and several European countries cutting or suspending some parts of their military and other assistance to Rwanda, this is important, especially given the fact that nearly half of Rwanda's budget comes from foreign assistance. Yet so far, the cuts have been largely symbolic, and on the ground, the abuses continue, and the M23 is currently seeking to expand its area of control west into Masisi territory. What I'm working on now is another aspect of the M23 rebellion, which is what's happening in other parts of North and South Kivu provinces. With the Congolese army focusing its efforts on containing or pushing back the M23, they've left a security vacuum in other areas, allowing armed militia groups to grow and flourish. Some of these groups are supported by Rwandan or M23 officials in an attempt to build a broader alliance against Congo's central government in Kinshasa, or just to wreak havoc and create a humanitarian disaster. These groups have been responsible for scores of ethnically-based tit-for-tat attacks over the past year, Local human rights groups have recorded the killings of over 1,000 civilians, mostly women and children hacked to death by machete, and the burning of nearly as many homes. Last week, I was in a town called Rubaya in southern Masisi territory. There I met a 12-year-old boy named Amani, whose story has been haunting me ever since I met him. Several weeks earlier, his village had been attacked by one of the most brutal local militia groups, called the Rai Mutumboki, which means people in revolt in Swahili. The combatants entered his village dressed in traditional raffia skirts and bare tops, beating on drums and shouting out that ethnic Hutu civilians needed to leave the village. Amani and his family, who are Hutu, quickly fled and hid in a thicket of reeds on the outskirts of the village. They thought they were safe, but the Rai combatants found them there, surrounded them, and quickly proceeded to hack them to death with machetes and spears. They were all killed except Amani. He had been carrying his baby niece on his back, and when the Rai killed her, Amani was covered in her blood, and the combatants assumed he was dead too. As Amani finished describing what happened, he spoke in a soft voice, stared at the corner of the ceiling, fidgeting his hands, and told me the names of those that he lost that day. His mother, his father, his four brothers and sisters, his aunt, his uncle, four little cousins. After the attack, 12-year-old Amani made it on his own to a displacement camp in a neighboring village several kilometers away. 
He told me what he most wanted was to find someone from his extended family who could take care of him and to be able to go back to school. We sent word out in the camp, and the next day, Amani was reunited with his grandfather. He assured me he would work to find a way to get Amani back to school. The type of unimaginable senseless brutality that Amani's family suffered is something I'd only heard about when documenting attacks by Joseph Kony's LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Congo. We will now watch a short video about the LRA and Abe Benoit Kinalegu. He is a hero in the struggle to expose the LRA's atrocities, rehabilitate its victims, and allow communities to report when the LRA is nearby. Abe Benoit has dared to speak out against the LRA's abuses when no one else had the courage to do so, and he's been the driving force in efforts to get the United States government to act to help stop Kony. He's also a dear friend, and the work that Human Rights Watch has done on the LRA over the past several years would not have been possible without his support, good judgment, and guidance. Thank you. These are the lucky ones, survivors of the latest campaign of terror by the Lord's Resistance Army. In every village, survivors tell stories of unimaginable horror, a horror with no end in sight. The Lord's Resistance Army, perhaps the worst, worst rebel group, emerged a quarter of a century ago and it has created havoc in northern Uganda, in southern Sudan, in eastern Congo and in the Central African Republic. Joseph Kony is the brutal leader of the Lord's Resistance Army. It's an army of children kidnapped from their huts, from their schools, brainwashed and forced to kill their own families and then told, we are your new family, now you fight for us. Each attack terrorizes entire communities. Most of the victims who were killed were beaten to death with heavy wooden sticks or machetes. Some of them were tied to trees before their heads were sliced. People across the areas affected by the LRA have felt completely abandoned and forgotten by their own governments. The international community neglected this for decades. There was no action to end the impunity for mass murder, mass rape, mass, mass pillaging. Abe Benoit Kinalegu is a Catholic priest in northeastern Congo, and he's also the head of the Catholic Justice and Peace Commission. He has traveled with us on numerous research missions to help document the LRA attacks. The LRA operates in extremely remote areas where there are no cell phones and the roads hardly exist. We went to the area around Daruma and there we found the grave sites where 82 people were massacred by the LRA on Christmas Day. These batons here were gourded with which we struck the head of people and the blood was left. Abbe Benoit has also helped set up a rehabilitation center for children who were abducted by the LRA. All of these children, when they do manage to escape, they're incredibly traumatized and it takes them years to reintegrate back into their communities. He's helped set up the early warning mechanism, which is a network of high frequency radio stations so that when people call in and report that there is an attack, protection actors will be deployed and forces might pursue the LRA. Je dois vous dire que les exactions de la LRA continuent dans la région. Abe Benoit was one of the leading advocates that helped U.S. Congress pass the LRA and Northern Uganda Recovery Act. With this legislation, the U.S. government has sent special advisors deployed to the region to help combat the LRA. Local activists, local heroes like Father Benoit, who are willing to risk their life for the most vulnerable victims, are incredibly important because they are the eyewitnesses to what happened, but they're also the key to the solution.
Mesdemoiselles, Messieurs et Mesdames. Ladies and gentlemen. Ce 24 dernier, il y a juste trois semaines, le village de Passy, dans le nord du Congo, a été complètement pillé par la LRA. This past October 24th, just three weeks ago, the village of Passy in northern Congo was completely pillaged by the LRA. Une vingtaine de personnes ont été enlevées pour quelques jours et une jeune fille a été malheureusement kidnappée et j'ai bien peur qu'on ne la voit plus jamais. 20 people were abducted for a few days and one young girl was unfortunately kidnapped and I fear that we won't see her again. Voilà une des dernières exactions de l'armée de résistance du Seigneur, la LRA qui depuis plus de 25 ans terrorise nos pays de l'Afrique centrale. That is just one of the most recent attacks of the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, which for more than 25 years has terrorized the countries of Central Africa. La LRA n'a aucun but politique. The LRA has no political objective. Leur seul objectif semble être de tuer et de mutiler sans raison les personnes humaines. Their only objective seem to be to kill and mutilate humans without reason. Ils enlèvent et kidnappent les enfants pour les transformer en enfants soldats ou pire en, escla en esclaves sexuels. They abduct and kidnap children to turn them into child soldiers or worse sexual slaves. Ils détruisent les écoles, les hôpitaux, les marchés, ils violent les femmes et surtout les jeunes filles. They destroy schools, hospitals, markets. They rape women and girls. Leurs actes de barbarie entraînent des conséquences humanitaires indescriptibles. These barbaric acts bring about indescribable humanitarian consequences. Le déplacement massif des populations, le manque d'abri, l'insécurité alimentaire, le non-accès des enfants à l'éducation, le faible accès des personnes aux soins médicaux et l'augmentation du taux de mortalité. Massive displacement of populations, lack of shelter, food insecurity, children who don't have access to education, limited access to health care, and an increase in the number of deaths. Face à cette crise et à la misère de mes populations, je ne me suis pas resté passif, je me suis mobilisé. Faced with this crisis and the misery of my population, I couldn't remain passive. I mobilized. J'ai mis en valeur toutes mes énergies pour soulager tant soit peu la souffrance de mes frères et sœurs de la région. I harnessed all my energy to relieve, even if just a little, the suffering of my brothers and sisters in the region. Pour ce faire, j'ai commencé à documenter et à dénoncer les exactions de ces criminels depuis l'année 2007 et raconter au monde entier qu'il y a au cœur de l'Afrique centrale une grande urgence humanitaire. I started to document and denounce the exactions of these criminals in 2007 and to tell the whole world that in the heart of Central Africa there's a serious humanitarian emergency. Pour bien documenter les faits, j'ai contribué à l'installation d'un réseau d'alerte précoce In order to document these exactions, I contributed to setting up an early warning network. Ces radiophonies aident les villageois à s'avertir les uns les autres afin de se protéger contre les éventuelles attaques de la LRA. These two-way radios help villagers warn each other so they can protect themselves from possible LRA attacks. Ces réseaux permettent également aux populations bénéficiaires d'être au courant de ce qui se passe dans les localités voisines. This network also allows populations to be aware of what's happening in neighboring villages. Les enfants qui parviennent à s'échapper de l'emprise de la LRA ont évidemment un grand besoin d'aide. The children who are able to escape the hands of the LRA clearly have immense needs. Ce sont pour la plupart des orphelins qui ne savent plus comment survivre, surtout les filles qui ont été violées et rendu à sainte par les militaires de Joseph Kony. Most are orphans who don't know how to survive, especially the girls who were raped and then became pregnant by Joseph Kony's fighters. J'ai créé un centre de réhabilitation et de réinsertion psychosociale dans la ville de Dungu 
où je vis actuellement. I created a center for rehabilitation and psychosocial reinsertion in the town of Dungu, where I now live. Ce centre offre à ses enfants un soutien psychologique, médical, matériel et une formation professionnelle qui va leur donner une nouvelle chance dans la vie. This center offers these children psychological, medical and material support and professional training to give them a new chance at life. En cette période de grave violation des droits humains dans notre région, les femmes sont les victimes les plus vulnérables. In this period of grave human rights violations in our region, women are the most vulnerable. C'est ce qui m'a poussé à créer au sein de mon organisation de la CDJP une cellule qui s'occupe des femmes. This is what pushed me to create within my organization, CDJP, a program for women. Cette cellule apprend à lire aux femmes, documente les attaques dont elles sont victimes et leur donne les outils pour devenir autonomes. This program teaches women to read, to document the attacks that they're victim of, and to give them the tools so that they can become autonomous. Comme vous pouvez le constater, ce sont des initiatives louables, mais elles demandent du temps, de l'énergie et des moyens financiers qui sont bien sûr toujours insuffisants pour répondre à toutes les nécessités de notre région. As you can see, these These initiatives are admirable, but they require time, energy, and financial means, which are still insufficient to respond to all of the needs in our region. Merci pour votre aimable attention. Thank you for your attention. A few minutes, I'd love to see if there are any questions in the house. And, uh, yeah, Norm, you're the first. Could you, could you please describe and evaluate for us the role of the United Nations peacekeepers in your region? Um, I'll start. So in, in northern Congo, or in Congo, there's MONUSCO, which is the UN peacekeeping mission that works throughout Congo, and they are deployed to northern Congo in the area affected by the LRA, um, but in pretty small numbers. To be honest, the main focus of MONUSCO is on eastern Congo, which is the area I was describing earlier. Um, and they, Abe Benoit can add to this, but in general they, you know, they have bases in some of the town centers, and they do help protect those town centers, but they don't venture very far out of the towns, um, and they aren't carrying out pursuit operations against the LRA. And in the other countries affected by the LRA, there aren't any United Nations peacekeepers, so in Central African Republic or this part of South Sudan. It's a very large area where the LRA is going after people and killing them. It's very extended. Et l'effectif des éléments des agents de la MONUSCO des métiers de la paix c'est très faible. And so therefore the effect of the UN peacekeepers is somewhat weakened by all of this. Cet effectif ne peut pas couvrir toute la région. Because obviously they can't cover the whole region. Raison pour laquelle eh, ces criminels profite de ces faibles effectifs pour, so pour tuer davantage les populations civiles. In order to kill the civil population as much as possible. Another question? There's one right here. Where? Where's the... Uh, tu parles en Swahili. Oh, vous bon. parlez Swahili? Non. No. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to say thank you, uh, first of all, for your fabulous work that you're clearly uh, doing on this, on this project. And I'm wondering if there's anything that's being done right now also on the big picture, because clearly um, you're describing amazing work that you're doing on the small scale. But as you talked about, the U.S. has actually been funding this war 
in many ways, inadvertently for many years, uh, through Museveni when it started in northern Uganda. And then others were funding LRA because as a sort of anti-US effort um, as well. And so now that it's shifted, I'm not sure who all the current funders of the LRA are, but clearly this is not only a regional but actually an international conflict that uh, I'm wondering what else we can do because there has been uh, there has been a role of the United States in this which has not been positive, uh, even when they sometimes think it is. So I'm wondering if you could make suggestions for us and what else is being done on the larger world uh, scale. Merci pour la question. Thank you for the question. Et je pense que les États-Unis travaille beaucoup dans notre région et que les États-Unis reconnaissent que les conflits de la LRA c'est un conflit euh, qui a une allure internationale. Uh, I believe the United States is really trying to work a great deal in our region and they have begun to recognize that this is an international conflict as well. Et le fait d'avoir signé une loi et d'avoir envoyé les conseillers militaires en Afrique centrale. And the fact that the president uh, signed a law into effect and also sent military advisors into our region. Est, une, est déjà une volonté manifestée de terminer avec la LRA. That already shows a willingness to deal uh, with the LRA. Je dois dire aussi que les États-Unis, l'administration des États-Unis d'Obama est en train d'installer dans la région des, des réseaux téléphoniques, des de, de téléphonies cellulaires pour... Et aussi, the United States administration has, uh, is doing a wonderful thing by uh, installing antennas in order to allow cell phone reception as a warning system. Uh, ces réseaux cellulaires peuvent peut aider la population civile à se protéger contre la LRA et aussi aider à uh, aider les, les opérations militaires. Uh, so that the cell phone reception, thanks to the antennas that are being installed, will not only help the local population to protect themselves, but also allow greater military intervention because of greater communication. Pour revenir à la question de savoir qu'est-ce que vous pouvez faire davantage, so if you want to know what you can do, je pense que vous connaissez, moi-même je sais que vous les Américains vous êtes pressés, vous êtes impatients souvent. I understand that in America you have a great deal of urgent energy and sometimes you might be impatient with us. <laughs> je crains que le Congrès puisse oublier cette urgence humanitaire en Afrique centrale. I'm so afraid that the American Congress will forget about the urgency of our situation in the Congo. Raison pour laquelle je souhaiterais que vous puissiez davantage faire pression sur vos représentants au Congrès. So I hope that all of you who are able to will put pressure on your Congress people in order to keep them interested in this very serious problem pour que le Congrès puisse pousser l'administration euh, Obama à finir de cette question une fois pour toutes. So that the uh, uh, Congress will keep after uh, President Obama and that together they will work to finally end this uh, situation once and for all. Je pense que Ida peut aider pour compléter les, la réponse. I believe Ida can continue and give you more information. Okay. We can maybe take the next question. Okay. Next question, please. You mentioned in Uganda that things are happening too. Could you be more specific as to what is presently happening with townspeople and communities in Uganda and which part of Uganda and if that is uh, close to the area in and around Kampala? Um, so, so the LRA is no longer active in Uganda. Since 2006, they moved into South Sudan and then to Congo and then on to Central African Republic. And currently, the LRA is only active in northern Congo and eastern Central African Republic. 
but the Ugandan army is still deployed in the region in, on operations against the LRA. Do you think there could be a, solu a military solution? Est-ce que vous pensez que il serait possible avoir une solution militaire to ce problème? Je pense que pour le moment, nous pouvons dire oui. C'est un des moyens de faire pression sur Joseph Kony. I believe that uh, as of now, I would say yes, and it's one way of putting pressure on Joseph Kony. Nous privilégions tous les moyens possibles qui peuvent aider Joseph Kony à faire défection. We would like to use all possible methods to try to get uh, people to defect from Joseph Kony. Vous savez que à plusieurs reprises, eh, Joseph Kony a résisté devant la signature des accords de paix. You know that uh, many times Joseph Kony has resisted signing any kind of peace agreements. Les opérations militaires peuvent l'aider probablement à signer les accords de paix. It's possible that military operations would force him to make some kind of peace agreement. Sinon, eh, il restera désormais en brousse et continuera à déranger les populations civiles. Otherwise, he will continue on his, uh, to perpetrate uh, his crimes and uh, affect the local populations. Maybe just to add to that, I think the only way that a, a military solution is going to be effective is if it's based on good intelligence and it's a you know, clear arrest operation going after the top leadership. Joseph Kony and Dominique Nguyen and Odiambo are wanted by the International Criminal Court. Um, and right now you have military operations. It's mostly the Ugandan army carrying out these operations. Now the U.S. special advisors are in the region, but they're mostly, they stay in their bases. They're supposed to be advising the Ugandan army, and that's helping a bit, but they're still pretty far from where the operations are happening. And the information that we have is that it's, you know, there's still a lot more that needs to happen in, ter in order to translate the intelligence that you have about locations of specific commanders into you know, effective operations targeted at the specific commanders who are wanted by the ICC. And we aren't seeing that yet. Is that possible? Of course, the microphone will help you. Yes. Yeah. Another question? I've got one. Please. Um, how actively is the Congo government uh, tracking down the LRA and trying to hold them accountable? Or is there a level of the government that is sort of acting in covert support? Or does the LRA ever act as sort of extrajudicial support for the government? Um, the, the LRA is operating in a remote corner of northeastern Congo that, to be frank, the central government doesn't care that much about. And they have, uh, we don't have any evidence that they've supported the LRA, but in, t in many cases they've denied that the LRA is a problem. They just don't want to have to deal with it. The LRA poses no threat to the central government in Kinshasa. Um, and so they have downplayed the threat by, posed by the LRA. Um, but that doesn't mean they're they're actively supporting them. Yeah, the question was, are there any other Western nations supporting the efforts to go after the LRA? Oui, et je pense que pour le moment, l'Union africaine est engagée I believe, yes, uh, that the African Union is also involved Et à combattre la LRA. to try to fight against the LRA. Raison pour laquelle, au mois de juin, and in the month of June, uh, a demandé au Conseil de sécurité de mobiliser des fonds. Uh, the African Union asked the Security Commission to uh, come up with some funds pour appuyer sa stratégie de combattre la LRA. in order to back its strategy of fighting the LRA. Je voudrais revenir un peu sur ce que Ida venait de dire. And I'd also like to go back on what Ida just said. Et la problématique de la LRA est vraiment régionale. The problem of the LRA is very much a regional problem et exige des solutions globales. And requires global solutions, international. Et, et que le problème aussi de la LRA n'est pas une menace pour les autres gouvernements de la région. 
n'est pas une menace. Good morning. The LRA is not a threat to the other governments in the particular region. Parce que l'endroit choisi par la LRA, c'est un endroit éloigné de tous les gouvernements centraux. And that's because the LRA has chosen an area that is not close to all the other uh, central governments. Si bien que tous les chefs de gouvernement minimisent cette question. And that's why most of the heads of these other governments have minimized the problem. Et c'est nous, la popu les populations civiles, qui en subissons les conséquences. And as a result, we're the ones, the civilian population, who have been subjected to the consequences of this, of, of having ignored the problem. Et raison pour laquelle, nous de la société civile, nous nous sommes mis debout pour dire non, nous sommes en train de souffrir. And that's why we've had to stand up, we, the civilian population, and said no, we've had enough of this suffering. Et le fait de se mettre debout pour dire que nous souffrons ne nous met pas à l'aise avec nos gouvernements. And the fact that we have stood up and said we do not want this kind of suffering anymore has put us in an awkward position with our governments. Okay. And just to get back to your, to your question, the, the European Union has supported to a degree the African Union efforts, so they've given some financial um, support to the AU headquarters, um, but it's pretty minimal, and I would say the, the general sense in Europe is that the Americans are taking the lead on the LRA, so they haven't gotten very involved. Thank you, Abe. Thank you very much, Ida. Thank you very much, Human Rights Watch. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>